So if you would, please take up your copy of God's word and turn to Matthew chapter 14. We're gonna be in verses one to 12. And I've spent the past few weeks going over this, pouring over this word that God has given us, pouring over the life of John and the importance of his story arc through Matthew. It all begins to sort of land here. And so I'd like to start off by reading the passage, Matthew 14, we're gonna be in verses one to 12. I'm gonna read through it just so we get a sense for where we're going, what's happening in the context of our message today. So starting in verse one, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead and that's why these miraculous powers are at work in him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised to give an oath to her to give whatever she might ask. Promptly or prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry. But because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded that it be given. And he sent and he had John beheaded in the prison and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. Let's open in a word of prayer. God, as we come before your word, Give us hearts that are soft and tender. God, I pray that your word would be heard well today, that your truth would convict and change lives. Pray that it will give us hope in you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So if you've been following along in Matthew, or if you've been reading previously, Matthew has just closed out a long set of Jesus' teachings. He's been teaching mainly in parables. We've heard a lot from Jesus about the kingdom of God and what it looks like and how it acts. The purpose of these parables was to both reveal truth to those who have ears and to conceal it from those who didn't. And as Jesus enters his hometown of Nazareth, he does very little there because they have just outright unbelief and rejection of him. And the story of Jesus in Nazareth closes out with a quote that points us to his nature as a prophet. And that theme of prophets seems to continue here, even into our portion here of Matthew 14. Now, right off the bat, if you've been reading through Matthew, or if you've read through Matthew, come to this story, you might ask a question. Why this story of John's death, and why here? The entire story is off of a single observation that Herod now knows of who Jesus is. And then Matthew uses that to tell us about John's departure from this earth. Herod heard about Jesus, and Matthew seems to convey that there's this weight that he's been walking around with. That when he hears about Jesus, there's this sense of heaviness on him that this is on his mind. When the stories of Jesus reach his ears, the memory of John the Baptist comes flooding back to him and Matthew chooses this point in the book to tell us about John. So let's keep this question in mind. I want you to be thinking about this as we, as we walk through this passage. We'll discover what Matthew has in store for us. So, picking up in verses one and two. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He's been raised from the dead. That's why these powers are at work in him. Jesus is still in his hometown at this point. 
And this Roman ruler, Herod Antipas, that we know from history, begins to hear about this man named Jesus. And by this point in Jesus' ministry, his fame has really begun to spread. As Herod is going about his business, that fame of Jesus captures his attention. Immediately, he's snapped and drawn to it. He's so captivated by this man that he comments to his servants about it. However, something about Jesus has gotten to him. Now, Herod mistakenly identifies and assumes that Jesus is some kind of resurrected version of John that's come back from the dead to haunt him. And we've sort of seen why. Nevertheless, Matthew is showing us that Jesus' fame is growing and it's spreading beyond the normal realms of people, even now to this popular Roman ruler who's taking note of him. And what we've seen mostly from Matthew about Jesus' life at this point is that there's been a lot on his teaching interactions. The last verse points out that he was in Nazareth. Jesus was not performing many miracles because of their unbelief. It's been almost two chapters since we've seen any real miracles highlighted of Jesus. Yet, the fame of Jesus still seems to lie with his miraculous powers. He's done many miracles up to this point. Herod, Herod's comment reflects the kind of rumors and popularities that circulated this peculiar man named Jesus. So many had in, encountered his incredible power in both his miracles and his teaching. I mean, he was drawing a lot of attention And he had repeatedly outwitted these really smart religious rulers trying to trap him in his words. He'd healed incurable diseases. He'd commanded and conquered uncontrollable demons. He'd even displayed godlike powers over the weather and the earth. The crowds loved him. However, this man named John was not someone that Herod loved. And if this Jesus character really was a resurrected, spiritually empowered John the Baptist, Herod had a big problem on his hands. So Herod's fear is on high alert. In verse three and four, we see the backstory. And for Herod, he had seized John and bound him and put him into prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had been preaching to him, saying to him, it's not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. Now you can see the problem, right? It's pretty obvious here. John the Baptist had been imprisoned by Herod because he grew tired of John's rebukes. Herod had stolen his brother Philip's wife If you read the history books, I'm not going to go deep into this, but if you read the history books, you would see how gross and depraved this whole event was, all of Herod's life. Both Herod and Herodias were married to other people. They divorced their current spouses and married each other. And that's bad. But what's worse is that Herodias is the daughter of Herod's half-brother. So it wasn't just his sister-in-law. She's also his half-niece. Herod's life of sinful passion is evident in this passage. John came to rebuke with the law, with God's law. John's message, he was proclaiming to Herod that he was breaking the Jewish laws that Moses had recorded in Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. And in these passages, God's law forbids sexual relationships between family members while God was made provisions for lawful marriages for the purpose of provision and protection, Herod's marriage was nothing like that. John was preaching to Herod about his blatant disregard for God's commands in this area. Herod's response was not favorable. And Matthew records that here. Herod wanted to put John to death. Now, There's more to the story that you can read in other gospels as well, but for some reason, Matthew's chosen to focus on this, and that's what we're gonna stick with today. John was a nuisance of a man to Herod, openly opposing him, openly opposing his sinful lifestyle with some outdated religious rule. 
Now, there's some interesting observations about John's ministry that I want to highlight for a second. He came preaching and teaching God's truth, and he was hated for it. Herod wanted to silence him. Herod wanted him to die, but he feared the people's reactions. The crowds realized that John was a great man, proclaiming the truth, but the ruling elite would not hear or obey. Does that remind you of anyone else recorded in Matthew? It's a good point of reflection for us. When we hear the word proclaimed, are we willing to listen and obey? Do we despise the message and the messenger when things are difficult to hear? Do we make excuses and work to silence the words that convict us? Are we the wise or the foolish man from back in chapter seven? Do we hear and obey the words of Jesus resulting in a stable home on a solid foundation? Are we the one who hears and rejects and ends up with a crumbling house? I just wanna ask how tender is our conscience towards God's word and our heart towards the Lord? There's also a quick side note on this text that I want to address. Some of you may wonder, why in the world would John go to a Roman ruler and start hammering the law at him? After all, the the Levitical law, Mosaic law, didn't apply to Gentiles. Doesn't that mean we should go out into the world then and hammer the world for all of their injustices and all of their sin? Should we expect unbelievers to obey God's word in this way? These are all excellent questions, but they're not necessarily the point of this text. A couple things that help us is that John's message of repentance is one for all people, including the Gentiles, who Matthew is actually writing to as well. Romans 1 reminds us that though the world will exchange God's truth for human lies, they're gonna call themselves wise. And Romans 8 teaches us that unbelievers have no power to obey God. And furthermore, we are living in a, no longer in an old covenant era. And we can approach people differently, engaging them in the hope that Jesus offers from the burden of laws and perfect living. We can repent of our sin and turn to Jesus as our hope. And that's the hope that's actually part of this text. That is what Matthew is pointing at. So let's, let's keep going here along. In verse six, we'll pick up and read. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was sorry because of his oaths and because of his guests, he commanded it. And he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. And she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it. And they went and told Jesus. This section here that we're taking up right now is actually a flashback. It's much like a modern movie where you're going along a plot line and you see some interaction and then the author will show you what happened a long time ago to fill in the plot so you understand it. Matthew recalls this extremely depraved birthday party. The event is setting, the event is setting that leads to the departure for John. For Herod's birthday gift, his stepdaughter came and danced for him and the rest of his party with the hopes of pleasing Herod. His lifestyle was anything but pure. This kind of gift seems like a strategic move to manipulate Herod through his sinful heart desires. In his compromised state of mind, Herod makes a foolhardy promise to his daughter. He swore to give her whatever she wanted. Herodias had prepared her daughter for this moment. 
And since Herodias also wanted to see John the Baptist silence, she planned with her daughter to bring the life and ministry of John to an end. It's at this point that Herod recognizes how foolish and utterly foolish his words were to offer this to his stepdaughter. We see sorrow on his part. But not because Herod's a good man wanting to preserve the life of John. Because Herod knew this was going to hurt. This is going to hurt his reputation. Verse 5 makes it clear that John is still alive because of how Herod is fearful people will see him. And now Herod's stuck in a mess of his own making. And he must fulfill the request of his stepdaughter and kill John. And since the stepdaughter's quest has this sense of urgency, demanding the head of John here on a platter, Herod has to act quickly and make good on his promise. So Herod does exactly what his stepdaughter asks. He sends the guards to rip John from the prison cell, gruesomely execute him with a grim death for a prophet. Since death wasn't the only objective of this request, they further degrade him by placing his head on a platter and parading it around this party, delivering it to the stepdaughter. Then she promptly delivers this gift, if I can call it that, to her mother, who's the mastermind apparently behind this whole thing. In God's sovereign plan, these are the circumstances and the timing that John departs the earth. The disciples of John come and they take what's left of his body. They give him a proper burial after a grotesque and degrading death. Then, once John's body is in the grave, they depart and go and they tell Jesus what's happened to a member of his family and his ministry forerunner. This is where Matthew closes his story. And we're inclined to feel this sense of gloom and this sense of darkness. The one who was promised to repair the way of Jesus is now dead. John's disciples are left without a master. They are needy not knowing where their provision is going to come from. Yet Matthew closes this story with John's disciples standing in the presence of Jesus. Hope is not lost. With John's death comes a glorious realization. His mission has been fulfilled. And if we recall that mission from earlier in Matthew chapter three, it's to prepare the way of the Lord, to make his path straight. And we see that prophesied in Isaiah 40 verse three. John's ministry was to turn the hearts of people to repentance and to Jesus who is their redeemer. As John departs the scene, so departs this last prophet. As the last prophet departs, so departs this Old Testament era. Everything now we are looking to Jesus. The sense of anticipation and hope is now in the air. The law that John was proclaiming in Herod is now waiting for full and final fulfillment in Jesus. Jesus is left here in the spotlight. Jesus, only Jesus. This, this is the point of the story. This is the answer to the question that we opened with. Why would Matthew put this story here? Why would he have it now? And why would he tell it in this way? John the Baptist has showed up multiple times throughout the book of Matthew, always with a name pointing us back to Jesus over and over again. And Matthew is using this story, this time, this event in history 
as a turning point in the book. It's a major turning point in his telling of the gospel of Jesus. So, as we continue exploring Matthew, be on the lookout and continue to look for what's changing. What's happened now that John has departed? How do these interactions look? As we walk away from this passage, this story, we want to ask, what do we do with a story like this? Great historical recurrence. There's a prophet of God and he died. It's a very wicked man in politics. Sounds normal. What do we do with this? It seems to be out of place in the book and yet here we are confronted with it. If you walk away from this sermon only to know that this is a transition point in Matthew, okay, that's good. But Matthew isn't writing this story, he's not writing this book just to tickle our intellectual minds. These aren't just facts and figures for us to collect and regurgitate later. He's trying to teach us something greater than just historical facts that will make us smarter. He's pointing us to something far greater. Now, we could also go to the opposite side. On one side, you have this intellectual mind, and the other side, you can go to the opposite extreme. You can look at Herod and Herodias and his stepdaughter and condemn them for all their wickedness and how terrible they are. We can judge the characters of the story for their faithlessness and for their rebellion against God's commands. However, I don't think that's the main point of what Matthew is getting at here. I believe Matthew is trying to point us to our desperate, and our ultimate need of Christ and Christ alone, of Jesus. He's showing us that the kingdom of God is at hand as we move from the old covenant into the new. So here's a few questions for us as we think. First, who do you believe Jesus is? Who is Jesus? Do you believe he's your only, only hope? When Herod hears of Jesus, his guilt leads him to misidentify Jesus. He believes Jesus is someone other than the promised Messiah who's come to save. And Matthew is making it clear that Jesus is the one who was promised. He's God. He's the one in whom we can hope He's the way, he's the truth, he's the life, as John puts it. And if you're listening to this today, come to him, whether you're here, whether you're online. Jesus says his yoke is easy, his burden is light. That doesn't mean it's a promise of an easy life. We have salvation through him. He's the only way to be saved from the destruction and the judgment that's to come. Stop working for your salvation. Come to Jesus. Second, how do we respond to the truths of God's word when we hear it? We've already sort of hit on this a little bit, but I want to drive it home. Are we quick to listen and to hear God's words as preached, as taught, as read? Are we eager to die to ourselves and to follow Jesus? This life is full of shiny trinkets and distractions, of worldly pleasures, of agendas and social issues with which we can take up cause and feel meaningful. There was a time in my life when I thought that way and I treated Jesus like my ticket to heaven and I could go indulge in the pleasures and comforts of the world. And I praise God that he's revealed to me the folly and the danger and that kind of thinking, drawing me to him. True disciples listen and obey. True disciples become more and more like Jesus. Are you eager to become more and more like your Savior? 
Thirdly, if I can use that word, true disciples are going to suffer. John the Baptist shows us the ultimate cost of discipleship with Jesus. And yes, at a basic level, we must lose our lives in the sense that we give up our passions of the flesh and we give up the things that we want and we live by the Spirit for God's purposes. And that's good. We are to do that. But sometimes, and often worldwide, quite literally, we will lose our lives for our great Redeemer. Are you prepared to live in a way where you uphold God's truth? You cling to it more than life itself because it's the only true hope. Are you committed to what God has revealed in scripture as the truth? Will you stand firm and will you stand confident for the truth of the gospel? And lastly, as we wrap up, where is your faith? Where's your faith? In this section of Matthew, he leaves us standing at the feet of Jesus. The disciples leave John in the grave and they come to Jesus who's standing alive. As believers in the new covenant era, we look back to now see Jesus, the promised one, standing alone as our salvation. No temples, no sacrifices, no works, nothing, nothing but Jesus. He's done it all. Our righteousness is not our own. Our hope is in the only sufficient sacrifice of Jesus. Our kingdom is not of this earth. This is not what matters most. Our kingdom is with Christ and with Jesus. There's nothing we can do to earn favor with God. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves from the wrath of God or the judgment of God because Jesus has done it all. And I say that again because we don't get it enough that Jesus has done it all. Is that what you believe? Do you stand at the feet of Jesus? Mercy and grace. Do you live your life knowing that we need salvation from the immeasurable punishment for humanity's rebellion against God? And for those of you who have answered yes, does your life show a deep sense of hope in that truth? Is it evident? Can people see it? Does every area of your life strive to show evidence that you are a child of God? Praise God that Jesus has accomplished what we could not. Praise God that we can stand here and we can see everything at the feet of Jesus because he is our salvation. He is our hope. Let's stand before our king. Let's go from here living in God's grace. Father, thank you that we can stand at your feet. Thank you that your work on the cross, your work to redeem us is enough. It's not of our own that we are saved. It's by you and you alone. Help us to live in that truth. Help us to appreciate it, to love it, to behold it, and to cherish it Help us to sacrifice for it. Help us to work in ministry because of it. Help us to engage with our neighbors because of it. God, we stand before you. No prophet, no law, no work is our hope. As the kingdom transitions from old to new in Matthew, Help us to appreciate and to love and behold the work that you've done for us. Amen.